I prefer to use a viscoelastic routinely for continuous curvilinear capsulorexis. I find Helon GV to have excellent pseudoplasticity during injection into the anterior chamber. Dr. Arshnoff has pointed out that this low viscosity at high shear rate provides surgeons with a distinct advantage, highly sensitive tactile feedback. Control of the injection force is thus increased. As well, Helon GV is highly viscous and elastic once it has settled into the anterior chamber. This aids in the stabilization of the anterior chamber. I use a pointed capsule forceps to puncture, grasp, and initiate the capsulorexis tear all in one motion. The capsule is regrasped only when necessary to control the tear. Due to Helon's high pseudoplasticity, it does not impede the passage of the capsule forceps. As well, it acts as a soft surgical instrument that holds the capsule flap where it is placed. I make the diameter of the capsulorexis either smaller than the optic of the implant to be used or larger so that the edge of the capsule is not partially over and partially under the edge of the optic. In order to better facilitate cortical cleanup, I'm using a bent cannula for hydrodissection to inject the first fluid wave in the superior position. Here I'm using a 90 degree 26 gauge cannula in a tenting and sweeping motion of hydro-free dissection. Then hydrodissection is performed, sending the fluid wave posteriorly and anteriorly. It has been our experience that cortical cleaving hydrodissection creates the cleanest dissection in the quadrant of injection. Thus, hydrodissection starting in the superior area may eliminate cortical cleanup in this difficult to reach 12 o'clock area. If necessary, additional hydrodissection and hydrodelineation are performed using the straight cannula. I rotate the nucleus to ensure complete cleavage in small pupil and other challenging cases. Downslope sculpting is my current refinement to the divide and conquer nucleofractus technique of phacoemulsification. Notice that the second instrument is stabilizing the nucleus for debulking the upper portion of the lens. A small groove is made and then stabilizing with the spatula and pushing to the right with a phaco tip, a vertical fracture is created. Subsequent radial fractures in the nucleus are created, dividing it into approximately six segments. Notice that the segments have been broken off without any pre-grooving. In this density of lens, and even in more dense lenses, pre-grooving for subsequent fracturing is unnecessary when one has sculpted deep into the central part of the nucleus for the initial fracture. This is the principle of downslope sculpting. The lens must be nudged inferiorly while sculpting in the upper portion of the lens down the slope of the concave posterior capsule. The central posterior aspect of the nucleus is reached quickly for quick, efficient fracturing. Once phacoemulsification has begun, the majority of viscoelastic will be aspirated out of the eye. However, a small amount will remain behind protecting the corneal endothelium. Even though phacoemulsification creates turbulence at the tip of the instrument, that turbulence is mostly confined to the capsular bag. Small bubbles will often remain motionless against the corneal endothelium, indicating little or no flow in that area. As illustrated here, you can see that in some cases the epinucleus takes almost as long to remove as the nucleus. Turning the vacuum and the flow rate down helps to facilitate removal of this softer material. Some cortical wisps are left behind when the fluid wave does not cleave right next to the capsule. I use the doubly bent 30 gauge cannula on a 3cc syringe for cortical cleanup in the capsule area under the incision. After phacoemulsification, if cortical cleaving hydrodissection has been used, the cortex comes along with the epinucleus and there is very little cortex remaining. If superior cortical cleaving hydrodissection is used, Cortex in the 6 o'clock area that remains is easily engaged with the irrigation aspiration tip.